Good morning, girls. Today we continue the discussions on modernist writers. So we have finished modernist poets, mainly T. S. Eliot, W. B. Yeats, and W. B. W. H. Auden. Today we will discuss some of the novelists, starting with D. H. Lawrence. D. H. Lawrence, 1885 to 1930. so he was a vastly different innovator and his working class background his obsession with sexual passion his open determination to preach and his casual attitude to to the novel as an art form are the four characteristics that distinguish him from other no list of the spirit virginia wolf his family had a huge impact on him as a novelist his father was a nottinghamshire miner he was barely literate and his mother was an ex school teacher who was increasingly dissatisfied with her husband's cultural level and desperately anxious for bertie that is david herbert to rise above his origins so mrs lawrence had this possessive devotion to her son and the tension of the family situation got represented in his autobiography semi autobiographical work sons and lovers which came out in the year 1913 it has a finely realized account of mining life in the midlands the situation of the morel family parallels that of lawrence's mrs morel the character the mother character in the novels also have this background of, of a middle class background and the passion that caused her to marry her minor husband dies soon and her love leaves her holy and then later her love gets directed to her son to her sons and especially four so these are the characters from sons and lovers so paul's psychological development is traced in a subtle manner and especially the growth of his interest in books and painting and the course of his early love affairs with miriam and clara actually that is an interesting part in my life so i got my name miriam from this particular work sons and lovers so this paul cannot escape the overpowering emotional bond imposed by his mother's love and he always fails to achieve a meaningful relationship with other girls with girls and here the personality of miriam she is nearly 16 very beautiful with her warm coloring her gravity her eyes dilating suddenly like an ecstasy so these are the lines from the novel so the personality of miriam is pitted against the competitive emotionally demanding paul's mother and there is this jesse chambers is the actual person who represents miriam in d h lawrence's life and after teaching training at university college nottingham and subsequent teaching at croydon lawrence turned to full time writing publishing his work 
the white peacock in 1911 and the trespasser in 1912 and in the meantime his mother had died and in 1912 lawrence fell in love with frida weekly so she was actually a married woman he took her away from her husband who was a professor in nottingham and her three children to another continent sexual passion thus had a practical primacy for him over other obligations and it was his, it was again his preoccupation in works like the rainbow which came out in the year 1950 and the and this work women in love so the formal no the rainbow covers the lives of three generations of a nottinghamshire family the bagwins and is concerned about the emotional career of ursula bagwin a sensitive woman who rejects deadening mechanization of spirit and environment by the mining industry and women in love is actually the sequence of the rainbow here there is gerdren and her sister ursula they are paired with gerald critch the son of a mine owner and rupert burkin a school inspector and the here gerald is a representative of the industrial ethic and burkin is the spokesperson for the passionate self two extremes so here lawrence was using the novel form to hammer out a view of his life and to exercise a radical effect on his readers thinking so sex based anti intellectualist theories are extravagantly developed in his works particularly in this non fiction work fantasy of the unconscious and these works all these works explore human relationships with psychological precision and also combines a detailed realism with poetic symbolism but although these works are technically more innovative and experimental all these novels owe much to the 19th century tradition of realism which was actually developed by george eliot and there is this controversial book work lady chatterley's love which dealt with which openly dealt with sexuality and it was most notorious book which was banned in england for its sexual content until there was a trial in 1960 and when you talk about the characteristics you understand that D H Lawrence was never a static thinker He was not a static thinker he does not hesitate to pit idea against idea even the theories that he likes may be propounded by one character and taken to pieces by another so he it is said that he lives his own problems on paper what you see in his novels is his own problems 
and tension in sexual feeling is a recurring theme in Lawrence fiction. Lawrence actually saw sexuality as a driving force in human relationships which could be both creative and destructive. And he was also concerned to find ways of describing the deepest experiences of his characters. And they had these themes of freedom from inhibition. So D. H. Lawrence is a novelist who was concerned to represent the innermost thoughts and feelings of his characters. In his development as a novelist, the story or plotline of his novels became less important than the shifts in feeling and the stream of consciousness of his characters. That is why it is said that he gave more importance to the innermost thoughts and feelings of the characters. So while probing this deeply into the recess of characters' psychology, Lawrence was actually trying to externalize their relationships within the outside world, with the outside world, particularly the world of nature. So here ends the description of D.H. Lawrence. Now we move to Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. So, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce felt that demands of the traditional novel with its emphasis on external realism so these are the elements, these are some of the elements you see in D. H. Lawrence. This external, he employed, though he belonged to modernist writers, he employed some of the 19th century techniques of realism in his work. But here, these are the two writers who believed that these traditional forms with the emphasis on realism were actually restricting this form. And such a, because they believed that such a form gave more importance to a plot development and there is this logical order which was not, according to them, not consistent with experience. So they thought that some kind of a new stylistic techniques are needed to reflect that experience. So there comes these two writers, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. We will start with Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf was born into a large, talented, upper-class intellectual family in London. So she was the daughter of Leslie Stephen. He was a famous Victorian biographer, critic and philosopher. And her mother died when she was 13. After it is said that after which she suffered the first of many nervous breakdowns. Her father exerted a powerful inhibiting influence over her and she later confessed, she even confessed that she could never have written her stories and novels while he was alive. And after his death, he, she became the sender of what is known as Bloomsbury Group. It is an artistic and literary group renowned for their rebellion against Victorian Puritanism and which had a great influence on British culture from 20s to the 40s. And mental illness affected Virginia Woolf throughout her life and it was in 1941 at a time of deep personal depression with the Second World War and deeply satisfied with her own writing, she committed suicide. Virginia Woolf's first novels were relatively traditional in form, but later she rebelled against what she called as the materialism 
of novelists such as H. G. Wells, Arnold Bennett, and John Galsworthy. So she rebelled against the techniques used by 19th century novelists, especially H. G. Wells, Arnold Bennett, and John Galsworthy. So her characteristic method appears in her third novel, Jacob's Rule, published in 1922, and here she renders the flow of experience through a stream of consciousness technique. But her work is also particularly characterized by an intensely poetic style. She utilizes poetic rhythms and imagery to create a lyrical impressionism which try to capture her character's moods with great delicacy and detail. So this novel shows her breaking free from traditional forms and the traditional concerns with external reality. So she believed that this materialism is completely untrue to life. So as diversity in individual character portrayal increased, so also did Virginia Woolf's concept of setting and space. So everything increased in the course of time. Her main novels include Mrs. Dalloway, 1925, To the Lighthouse, 1927, and The Waves, 1931. And Mrs. Dalloway describes the events of one single day in Central London through the mind of one single character, a single character, Clarissa Dalloway, who is to be the hostess of a party for high society friends and it contains many flashbacks to Clarissa's experiences as she seeks to bring together past memories and present actions and she tries to balance, bring out a balance this private world with a need for communication with other people. And there is this other work, The Waves, in which Virginia Woolf takes six characters who are all at different stages in their lives. She explores how each one of these characters is affected by the death of a person they all knew well. And into the lighthouse, into the lighthouse, two days in the life of a family on holiday are recorded, one before the Great War and one after it, when some of the characters have died. Again, Virginia Woolf is more interested in her character's mental processes than their visible physical actions. Along with that, Virginia Woolf was also a highly influential journalist and critic. She had this work a room of one soul in which she gives a unique account of why a woman must have money and a room of her own in order to write fiction. So she takes the, of the character of Shakespeare's sister. What would have happened if Shakespeare had a sister and if she had started to write so this book is a 
has become a classic statement of feminism. And some of her many reviews and critical essays are collected in The Common Reader. And with her husband, Leonard Wolf, she founded the Hogarth Press in 1970 and the press published Virginia Woolf's own work and the works of other modernists such as T.S. Eliot. So here ends Virginia Woolf. Now we will move to James Joyce. So James Joyce shares Virginia Woolf's concern to render the inner lives of characters. But though they used this technique of stream of consciousness, the technique of stream of consciousness used by James Joyce is completely different from that of Virginia Woolf. And James Joyce, talking about James Joyce, his contribution to the development of the novel in English in the 20th century goes beyond this particular techniques of formalist, formal experimentation. His contribution was a major one on several levels. He was born in Dublin educated in Ireland and spent most of his adult life in Europe, mainly in France, Italy and Switzerland. In Europe, he was at the center of literary circles, but he remained throughout his life. Throughout his life of voluntary exile from Ireland, a deeply Irish writer. And he wrote only and always about Dublin. To write about Dublin and its people was for Joyce to write about all human experience. Joyce wrote something in each of the principal genres before concentrating on fiction. He had poetry, play like Exiles, Dubliners. It is one of his famous short story collection. So this collection, Dubliners, his first short stories depict the lives of the ordinary people of the city, city of Dublin, with clarity and realism. The stories are carefully organized so that Meanings arise not only from the individual sketches, but also from the relations between them. The best known of these stories among this collection, the Dubliners, is the final one titled The Dead. That is the final one in the sequence and to which many of the previous stories point. That is why I told earlier, all these stories together give a meaning. It is not like individual sketches in individual stories. So the final one, the dead, is to which many of the previous stories point. So it is a story in which a husband is shocked out of his self-satisfaction and egotism by learning of his wife's love for another young man she had known many years before. So the themes of the many stories in Dubliners is the attempts of many of the citizens to free themselves from lives in which they feel paralyzed by relationships, by social, cultural and religious traditions or by their own nature. So we see people freeing themselves from all those things which bind them and how they become 
detached and neutral. So here we see how James Joyce masters this short story form. And now we move to his novels. His first major novel is A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It is a semi-autobiographical work and tells the story of Stephen Dedalus from the very earliest days of his life, showing him growing into adulthood and independence under the powerful influences of Irish national, political and religious feelings. The novel shows how he gradually frees himself from these influences and decides to become an exile from Ireland and to dedicate his life to writing. That is why we said earlier that it has some connection to, uh, to the writer's life. So this is a semi-autobiographical work. So here this character develops a view So it can be compared to wasteland. So like T.S. Eliot in poetry, here Stephen, Stephen Dedalus, who may or may not represent Joyce ideas, believed that true artist had to be objective and not simply give direct expression to his feelings. And here he compared the artist to the God who remains within or behind or beyond or above his handiwork, invisible, refined out of existence, indifferent, bearing his fingernails. So these are the lines from the novel itself. And his another work, Ulysses, is considered as the high point in modernism. So I am sorry, this is the work which is compared to the wasteland. Ulysses is the high point in modernism, bearing the same relationship to the development of the novel as the wasteland does to poetry. And both the wasteland <coughs> and Ulysses both were published in book form in 1922. Some chapters of Ulysses had already appeared early, serially in 1918, and met with serious censorship problems. And as a result, Joyce had great difficulty. They said that Joyce had great difficulty in finding a publisher for the whole book, which finally came out from Shakespeare and company in Paris and copies were seized in both Britain and America and controversy continued for several years. The first open editions were published in the United States in 1934 and in Britain in a limited edition in 1936 and a popular edition came out in 1937. And in addition to its innovative techniques of stream of consciousness, so I should say that this is the most difficult book to read in English literature, I should say that. So it had these innovative techniques of stream of consciousness. And along with that, this novel exhibit a wealth of forms and styles and explores a rich variety of ideas. And here the most striking is the use of Homer as a model. So the characters and episodes of the novel have parallels with ancient Greek stories although the comparisons are often deliberately comic or ironic. 
However, this connection with the episodes from Homer's Odyssey gives the novel a wider, more universal significance. Ulysses actually tells the story of one day, that is just one day, that is June 16th, in the lives of Dublin citizens and vividly evokes the life of the city. And here, the main character, Leopold Bloom, becomes a modern Ulysses, and every man in Dublin, which becomes a microcosm of the world. Dublin actually represents a microcosm of the world. And James Joyce has his last work, Finnegan's Week, which is said that it took 14 years to write. And in this novel, Joyce attempted to present the whole of human history as a dream in the mind of a Dublin innkeeper, H.C. Yerwicka. And here, any attempt to depict life realistically is completely abandoned. Devices of literary realism are replaced by a kind of dream language in which as many associations as possible are forced into words and combinations of words. So in many ways the novel is about language itself. James Joyce uses puns and plays on words within and across both English and other languages. And he pushes language to the absolute limits of experiment. And for the most readers, the result is a very demanding, sometimes very difficult, incomprehensible experience. So, I should say that among these works, a portrait of an artist as a young man is relatively simple when compared to his other two works, Ulysses and Finnegan's Week. So we come to the end of the discussions on D.H. Lawrence, Virginia Woolf and James Joyce. So I know these writers are new to you. So please listen to this lecture carefully. Make notes out of it. If you have any doubts, please contact me. Thank you girls. Have a nice day. So these are the cover pages of his works, Ulysses, a portrait of the artist as a young man and Dubliners. It is his short story collections. So thank you girls. Have a nice day.